Good morning. Today's scripture reading is going to be Matthew 4, verses 18 through 21. And I'll read that from the message for us today. Walking along the beach of Lake Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew. They were fishing, throwing their nets into the lake. It was their regular work. Jesus said to them, Come with me, I'll make a new kind of fisherman out of you. I'll show you how to catch men and women instead of perch and bass. They didn't ask questions, but simply dropped their nets and followed. A short distance down the beach, they came upon another pair of brothers, James and John, Zebedee's sons. These two were sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their fish nets. Jesus made the same offer to them, and they were just as quick to follow, abandoning boat and father. Just check and see how it was on. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we be in your house. And we thank you for these uh, old hymns that mean so much. Help us to answer your call. We know that you are the absolute sovereign ruler of the universe, and you will not lead us astray if we stay on your pathway. Be with me as I bring this message this morning. You know my my fear, and uh, I need you to calm my spirit. This thing is in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of my sermon today is The Cost of Grace. You say, well, I thought grace was free. Yes, grace is free, but it's not cheap. That title comes from the book by Diedrich Bonhoeffer. It's called The Cost of Discipleship. Well, the original title in German is Nachfolge, which means follow after. So discipleship doesn't quite have the meaning that, uh, that Bonhoeffer would have for it. You think of discipleship, what's a disciple? It's the Latin word for student or, or pupil. Um, but Bonhoeffer was thinking more uh, of what the disciples' life would be after he had left. They would no longer be disciples. The word disciples is only used in the four Gospels and Acts. No place else in the Bible is it used. And why is that? At Pentecost, they became not disciples, but they were the teachers, and they spread the message. In the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 18 through 22, 22, are not only an invitation to follow him, they're a commission that's backed with a, a promise. He says, I will make you fishers of men. And he doesn't say, I will teach you to be fishers of men. The Greek actually actually says, I will make you fishers of men. You can teach people about Jesus for years, and they may never accept, um, accept the truth about Jesus. And Jesus calls us all to follow him. But there are those that for whatever reason, we'll never follow him. And he says, I will make you fishers of men. It's only his authority that, and through the Spirit, can do that. And I think back to John 1.12, it says, As many as received him, he gave them authority to become children of God. And the word authority in the Greek is exousion, and it literally means supernatural power. 
It's not just written authority, it is the power of God. That same commission is given to us today. He doesn't expect us to sit around and draw flies, I guess. He wants us to go out and spread the message. And for those who have chosen to follow, that commission is mandatory, whatever the cost. And there will be a cost. When I was in my senior year of college at the University of Idaho, I took a class that was called German Culture and Institutions. And that dealt with that time period from 1871 when Bismarck unified the, the states of, of Germany through the Weimar Republic through the end of 1945, the Nazi era. And uh, that was a <laughs> Terrible time. The Weimar Republic only lasted 15 years, but it was just a horrible time. There were so many different political parties that you couldn't walk down the street without somebody shooting at you from the, the uh, balcony of their home. And, um, when When Bonhoeffer was a young man, at the age of 13, he decided he would answer the call, uh, God's call, which was uh, kind of costly for him. He waited for a full year before he told his parents that he wanted to study theology. For the, <laughs> one of the reasons uh, his father, at best, was an uh, agnostic and may have been uh, atheist. He was the leading authority on psychiatry in Europe at the time. And, uh, and Bonhoeffer's mother, on the other hand, was, uh, had much of her ancestors had been theologian. So when Bonhoeffer made his uh, decision to study theology, she was probably pretty happy about it. But his sisters and brothers were not. Even his twin sister uh, wasn't happy about his decision. And they tormented him about it, just constantly, just giving him grief. And uh, his oldest brother was an atomic physicist that worked with Albert Einstein and Max Planck in Berlin. And he especially wanted to torment Diedrich about it. But Diedrich got to the point where one day he said, if you knock my head off, God still exists. So that's his. The German church in the, during the Weimar Republic was just totally dead, there's no spirit left in the church. Uh, but Bonhoeffer was able to see the workings of the Holy Spirit when uh, Bramwell Booth from the Salvation Army came to Berlin in 1921, and he attended uh, several of the evangel evangelistic meetings, and he saw the Holy Spirit work. And he wouldn't see that again until 1931 in the United States in, the, in a, a black church in, in New York, the Abyssinian Baptist Church. But I've got a, a uh, this is the book about Bonhoeffer. It's called Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Prophet. Pastor Market, Modern Prophet, Spy. And the forward to it is written by T. 
Timothy Keller, who is a well-known pastor and uh, author. He writes a foreword to it here. He states, when I became a Christian in college, Bonhoeffer's Cost of Discipleship was one of the first books I read, followed not long after by his, his life together. Though this second book is perhaps the finest single volume I have ever read on the character of the Christian community, it was this first book that set me on a lifelong journey to understand the meaning of grace. It is impossible to understand Bonhoeffer's Nachfolge without becoming acquainted with the shocking capitulation of the German church to Hitler in the 1930s. How could the church of Luther, that great teacher of the gospel, had ever come, had ever come to such a place? The answer is that the true gospel summed up by Bonhoeffer as costly grace had been lost. On the other hand, the church had become marked by formalism. That meant going to church and hearing that God just loves and forgives everyone, so it doesn't really matter much how we live. Bonhoeffer called this cheap grace. The very first chapter, very first sentence in Bonhoeffer's Cost of Discipleship states, cheap grace is the mortal enemy of our church today. So. On the other hand, there was legalism, or salvation by law and good works. Legalism meant that God loves you because you have pulled yourself together and are trying to live a, a good, disciplined life. Both of these impulses made it possible for Hitler to come to power. The formalists in Germany may have seen things that bothered them, but saw no need to sacrifice their safety to stand up to them. Legalists responded by having pharisaical attitudes toward other nations and races. Those attitudes approved of Hitler's policies, but as one, Germany lost hold of the brilliant balance of the gospel that Luther persistently expounded. We are saved by grace alone, but not by faith without it, which is alone. That is, we are saved not by anything we do, but by grace. Yet, if we have truly understood and believe the gospel, it will change what we do and how we live. And that's the, that's the metanoia, the Greek word for repentance is metanoia. It's a change of mind. By the time Hitler's ascension, much of the German church understood grace only as an abstract acceptance. God forgives us, that's his job. But we know that true grace comes to us by costly sacrifice. And if God was willing to go to the cross and, it, and endure such pain and absorb such a cost in order to, to save us, then we must live sacrificially as we serve others. Anyone who truly understands how God's grace comes to us will have a changed life. That's the gospel, not salvation by law or by cheap grace, but costly grace. Costly grace changes you from the inside out. Neither law nor cheap grace can do that. Then Keller asked the question, this lapse couldn't happen to us today, surely, could it? And he says, certainly it could. I'll find my place again here. The story is told by a Dr. James McHenry, delegate to the Constitutional Convention in 1787. He relates the conversation that took place between uh, a woman from Philadelphia uh, named Mrs. Powell and Benjamin Franklin. As Franklin was coming out of the Constitutional con uh, Hall, a woman approached and Mrs. Powell with a question. She said, well, doctor, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? And he turned to look at her and he said, uh, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. And the, the emphasis on the you. He was telling her, in a democracy, the people uh, are the ones that govern 
not rule. And there's the difference there, a very stark difference. Governments are to govern, not to rule, because the Lord God Almighty is the absolute ruler of the universe. And that's where um, democratic, democratic type governments fail. Franklin had a good reason for being skeptical, and he he probably thought that uh, democracy would last for a little while. Um, France overthrew their monarchy in 1792, the French Revolution, and it lasted. The, the their republic lasted 12 years, but it was called the Reign of Terror. They uh, they guillotined all the, the monarchy uh, and a lot of the, the, the heads of the church as well because the people had thought the church had uh, allowed the monarchy to do what it did. There wasn't any food in, in, in uh, pre-revolutionary France. But uh, why is our democracy uh, kept going? France has had five republics. Four of them have turned into either a monarchy or the, the fourth one when Hitler came to power. It was the end of the third monarchy. The fourth monarchy when Charles de Gaulle became president of France he was uh, prime minister of France, president of France for, from 45 to 58, and he was not willing to give up power, so, so they voted out the whole republic and put in a new republic, and it's the fifth republic. And that republic is on shaky ground today. So, why has our republic lasted 237 years? There's a good reason. In 1831, the French government, which was called the July Monarchy, uh, sent a young man, 26 years old, named uh, Alexis de Tocqueville to the United States. And his mission basically was to study the jails and penitentiaries in the United States and return and set up that type of system in France. But what he got to, to uh, the United States, yeah, it says, upon arrival in, in the United States, he stubbered, discovered the secret of American success. He states, not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with, with righteousness, did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because she is good, and if she ever ceases to be great, she will cease to be good. So. He also wrote, liberty cannot be established without morality. And there is no country in the world where the Christian religion retains a greater influence over the souls of men than in America. There are a lot of critics today to say, well, he's, he's nuts. The founding fathers weren't religious. Uh, I beg to differ. These are some comments from uh, some letters from the first three presidents of the United States. Washington writes, let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that the national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principles. John Adams, who was a devout Christian, by the way, uh, said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people, it is inadequate to the government. Owed. It is inadequate to the government of no other. 
Adams was perhaps the most orthodox uh, Christian president. He was a, a uh, abolitionist as well, one of the first abolitionists. Abigail Adams, his wife, once asked George Washington if George Washington thought that God was punishing the colonies for the sin of slavery. Jefferson, third president. A lot of people think Jefferson was an atheist or at best an agnostic or a deist. Uh, these words kind of refute that. This is his notes on the state of Virginia in 1785. Can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that the liberties are the gift of God, that they are violated but with his wrath. I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. That's not the words of an atheist. The Supreme Court, in the years between 60, or 62 and 6, 1962 and 1963, took Jefferson's words that there will be a wall of separation between church and state, and went with that and removed Bibles from schools. That's, that statement is not found in the Constitution, nowhere in the Constitution. It was a letter to a pastor in, in Danbury Church in New Jersey. And he didn't mean that, that the government was forbidding people to have, to have their own religion. It was forbidding the government to set up a national church like there was in, in uh, England. France, Germany, all the European countries had their own church. And most of your relatives, most of your ancestors, everybody in here probably had an ancestor that came to this country to avoid that persecution. I know my did. My ancestors came in 1682. They were Quakers. And they came to this country because they were being persecuted. And it's kind of funny because when the Quakers first got here the Puritans persecuted them and made it and had laws where they couldn't uh, have church services. Now we got some questions that I came up with. If wrong page. Uh, that statement by Jefferson that justice cannot sleep forever. That's kind of a disturbing sentence. But I got to thinking, if God somehow allowed Washington, Adams, and Jefferson to be transported into 2024, what would they think? They would find no Bibles in schools. For one thing, they would find that. Um, that uh, four uh, young theologians in 1966 declared God dead. And I got the names at home, if you're interested, the name of the four. In 1966, they came up with the God is dead theory. Time Magazine came up with an article, uh, red letters on a black background that said, Is God dead? 1966. Uh, Five years later, the uh, same time, 
Time uh, magazine had an article of the face of Jesus that Jesus revolution. God proved he wasn't dead. That that uh, that, rep, that uh, revival in 1971 that started by Chuck Smith and and uh, Greg Laurie and and uh, Greg er, Frisbee swept the country. Another question, what would Bonhoeffer think if he was transported into Berlin today? Bonhoeffer died 39, at 39 years old, hung by the Nazi party two weeks before Hitler committed suicide. Hitler had him killed just for revenge, just no reason for it. He was afraid to have him killed while uh, well, he, Hitler was afraid that the people would rise up if they killed off Bonhoeffer, because Bonhoeffer was a very well-respected man. But uh, in 1945, April, two days or two weeks before Hitler's own suicide, they hung Bonhoeffer. And on the way out the door to the gallows, he said, the end is near. Then he said, my, but my beginning starts today. So, what would Bonhoeffer think if he found himself in Berlin in 2024? He would find the Nazi party alive and well in Germany. It was outlawed in, in 1945. He would also find the Nazi party in France, Italy, and the United States. At one time, the United States, the only the only country that had a Nazi party was the United States. All else, there, it was banned. But in the last election, Macron of France barely won the election. The, his opponent was a Marie Le Pen, who was a neo-Nazi, and actually belongs to a neo-Nazi party. In Italy, the Prime Minister of Italy is a woman named Georgia Maloney, and she is a practicing neo-Nazi. And the Nazi party in the United States has been here and it, it is growing in strength. That's well, kind of depressing, you know, to think about that. You know, our, our fathers and sometimes grandfathers went to, to Europe to fight the Nazi party, but it's more active today than it, in the United States than it was before. But I found a word of encouragement in the writings of de Tocqueville. The greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than any, any other nation, but rather in her ability to repair her faults. But, no person or party is able to repair, repair these faults without churches that are on fire for God. I got this quote from a Beacon Bible commentary. It's by Ralph Earle. He was one of the leading theologians in the Nazarene Church. He writes, Peter and Andrew were privileged to be the first two whom Jesus invited to join him in his work. It is strike, a striking fact that Christ called four fishermen as his first disciples. He still calls men from all walks of life to preach his gospel. He needs rugged, he needs rugged men of courage who have learned to face hardships with patience and perseverance. I'm thankful that he needs a few of us older folks as well. It's our mission. There's no other mission uh, that is more important than, than spreading the message of good news. And those people, those friends of ours are, are church members, different churches, family members, and friends that have not 
answered the call. We need to be out there continually with the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's only that's the only thing that's gonna really repair the damage is when the Holy Spirit sweeps through the nation again like it did in 1971. I pray for that every day. Well, well thank you for coming. I'm not a preacher, by the way. <laughs> I'm not a preacher at all. I just fell in for the pastor, and we're going to miss pastor when he's gone. And I pray, I pray we get another another pe preacher of the same caliber. I really do. And, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these people that have come here today and their patience. Uh, Lord, I'm not a preacher, but Lord, I know that your message can come through. Be with us for the rest of the, this service, Lord, in the Sunday school that follows, and touch each and every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen.